Rachel, we're here together on Friday the 25th of March and I just wanted to start by asking you as a leading member of our international arbitration team what retaliatory actions Russia might take against foreign companies. Well, Russia has taken certain actions and has hinted that it will take further actions like imposing restrictions on the transfer of foreign currency, like uh, authorising Russian companies to use foreign-owned IP and patents uh, without paying any compensation to those foreign owners, uh, like seizing foreign-owned aircraft, um, and even like nationalising the assets and buildings of foreign companies that have decided to leave Russia um, and leave the Russian market. Can you explain a bit further what these international treaties are and how do they apply to the current situation? So there are generally uh, in force around the globe bilateral investment treaties and multilateral investment treaties. So between two governments in the case of a bilateral treaty or BIT or BIT um, or more than two governments in the case of a multilateral treaty. Um, and the purpose of these investment, uh, investment agreements when they were signed, it was to attract foreign direct investment. So for example, state A and state B would have signed an agreement and to attract investment, uh, state A would have promised the nationals of state B uh, protection of their investments when they come and invest in state A. And equally, state B would have afforded the nationals of state A the protection of their investments if they came and invested in state B. Um, and the kinds of protections that are typically offered are things like um, guarantees against expropriation, guarantees against unfair and inequitable treatment, um, guarantees the free transfer of funds by investors out of the jurisdiction, um, non-discriminatory treatment, uh, and so on. So it's these kinds of protections uh, which Russia may now be violating, um, w which is why they are now relevant in the present context. Okay, and is, is Russia normally a party then to these investment treaties? Yes, so there are currently over 60 uh, BITs in force uh, to which Russia is a party. And they include treaties, so between Russia on the one hand, and then on the other hand, um, countries like the UK, uh, the majority of the EU member states, Switzerland, um, Asian states like Japan, Korea, Singapore, uh, Middle Eastern states, so uh, Qatar, UAE, Kuwait, Latin American states, so that there are, there are a lot around the globe in force to which Russia is the party. So what happens if a state breaches those protections? What can an investor or foreign company then do? Well, in that situation, uh, in this case, for example, Russia would have violated its obligations under international law. Um, and an investor, if there were an applicable BIT in force, would then have a direct recourse against the state via international arbitration. So it would be able to bring its claims directly against the state um, in international arbitration outside the jurisdiction in a neutral uh, forum. What would qualify a business to be able to seek relief under these treaties? Well, it depends on the exact wording of the specific treaty, which is applicable, because although um, bilateral investment treaties are all very similar, they're not identical. So it's always important to check the wording very carefully. But typically, uh, an investor would need to show that it was a, a qualifying investor under the treaty. So either it was a national or a company incorporated in the home state. Um, then it would need to show that it had a qualifying investment in Russia, um, and investment is often de defined broadly, so it, it could be shares in a company or, or factories or business, it, it's defined very widely. Um, and then it would simply have to identify the protections which are available to it and the action that's been taken by Russia which has breached those, um, those protections. Okay, could you give me a sort of simple example of, of that in practice in the, these current circumstances? Yes, of course. So a very simple example. Um, let's take the UK-Russia BIT. Um, so, for example, a UK company may have invested in Russia, may have built a factory and, and operated a factory in, in Russia. Um, in that scenario, the UK company would be the investor. The factory in Russia would be the investment. And if Russia, for example, came along and nationalised that factory, that may count as expropriation under the UK-Russia Bilateral Investment Treaty, which is guaranteed not to do. 
um, and that, that, that expropriation, that nationalisation may therefore uh, breach that treaty and give rise to a claim under international law. What remedies would our clients be entitled to under these provisions? So the investor, harmed investor would, in the, in the case of a breach uh, of these protections, it would be entitled to be put in the position that it would have been in but for the breach having occurred. And that's normally achieved either via, well, rarely actually via restitution, normally by compensation. And how successful do these tend to be? Very successful. So investment treaty arbitration is now a widely recognised means of um, repairing harmed investors' rights under international law. Um, and the result of these arbitrations is a final binding award that can be enforced globally. So not, not in Russia, outside the jurisdiction, um, globally under the New York Convention, um, which has been signed up to by 169 countries. And in any of those 169 jurisdictions, you can take that final award and you can enforce it as if it were a final binding judgment of the highest court of, of that land. Um, and in other cases, um, you can enforce under the ICSID Convention, but Russia isn't party to the ICSID Convention. So in this case, it would be the New York Convention. OK, and in your, in your line of work, are you expecting, because of the current circumstances, to see a substantial increase in disputes? Absolutely, yes. I think... Given the number of in-force treaties to which Russia is a party and the amount of foreign investment in Russia on the one hand and then coupled with what we're seeing uh, Russia doing at the moment and what's, what it's hinted towards uh, it might do, um, that I think we can say without um, shadow of a doubt that yes, we will be seeing a significant rise in disputes. And just finally, Rachel, from your perspective as an arbitration partner, what would you say the key takeaways are for our clients watching today? So I think it's important to be aware of these options under bilateral investment treaties. Um, I think it is important at this stage for businesses with foreign interests in Russia to start performing some kind of corporate analysis to see whether these investment treaties apply, either directly, so if there, for example, was a direct treaty between the UK and Russia, or indirectly, uh, for example, America doesn't have a BIT with Russia, but lots of foreign companies invest through subsidiaries, so it's important to look at the corporate structure of an investment and see if, where and how an investment treaty might apply. And then once that has been identified, you can look at those specific treaties and identify the relevant protections um, and investments and see whether they have been breached. So that's the first thing to do, just look at the options available. The second thing to do um, with you know, the, a view to a potential claim is to try and start gathering evidence. So that would include preserving evidence, so preserving documents that might be in Russia at the moment, whether that be through getting them out of the country or taking copies, um, gathering communications with the Russian government, um, t making notes of the damage that's being sustained to investments um, and potentially even kind of generating valuations of the investment as it was worth at the date of the invasion on the 24th of February. Um, essentially preparatory steps for, for any p future claim. And of course Mayor Brown can help with, with any of those actions. Thank you.